All right, and when you're ready, I'm going to start sharing, uh, and you have the very fun part of talking. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so I have no idea how any of this works. I'm sorry. And uh, yeah, I, I see everyone else knows how this, how this works. And, and um, I think I said in the, the tech um, discussion that I'm actually not a gamer. Um, and but here I am giving my um, feminist critique of, of such games. And so we'll jump right in and, um, and look at some of these things. So if you could go to the next slide, that'd be great. Uh, next one, please. So, oh, actually, go back, go back. We'll have a little introduction. So I was invited by Ubisoft in Montreal to help with consulting on Assassin's Creed Origins and to work with them on architecture, um, imagery, clothing, some other things. And um, there, you know, it was um, an interesting experience. I probably put in, you know, 10 to 20 hours total. So very, very limited. And I have my own um, thoughts about the authenticity of the game, but let's go ahead and keep it to the history and uh, personal uh, perceptions of Cleopatra in our discussion. So that's, that's a bit about my background. And if you could go to the next slide. So we're focusing on Cleopatra and what her, how she's um, portrayed what her body looks like, what her age looks like, what her face looks like, what the garments look like. And really, uh, it's also a discussion of her personality and perceptions of female rule in particular. And this is a big part of, of this game. Um, so let's, let's jump into a little more discussion of that. Next slide. So you'll see that from the, just the last two images that I've shown you, um, from the Assassin's Creed game and from these screenshots, and I'm sorry, not playing like everyone else is playing these things. There's absolutely no way. Um, but she is presented as a as a young, nubile uh, woman with a perfect body, and that body is revealed and shown. Now, I'm not trying to say that it would be completely inauthentic for the ancient Egyptians to show a bit of flesh. Um, but the kinds of garments that, that we're showing are not necessarily things that the ancient Egyptians themselves would have worn, nor the kinds of garments that you would have seen worn in, in ancient Rome or ancient Greece at this time. So there is an attempt to sexualize this woman, to, to overtly sexualize her and to make that the thing that you see. You look at her face first, then you look immediately at her breast, then you look at the midriff that is exposed. Um, next slide. And you see all kinds of other exoticisms, um, orientalizing exoticisms shown here because this game is played through a Western lens. So you are there um, coming from, uh, I, one would expect like a Roman world and you would associate more as an American or European or Canadian with that Roman voice. And then you go to this exotic place, this Egypt, and you see that there's a dead lion there that she places her feet upon. Um, not an authentic Egyptian thing, but certainly something that we understand in terms of the hunt, um, the person that gets access to killing these, these creatures. Um, I mean, I, you know, you could put in there Don Jr., Trump Jr., and his brother, Eric, and show them with the, you know, endangered animals and their latest kill, that kind of thing. So, so you have that here as well. And the orientalizing, um, to use Edward Said's phrase, I think is, is very clear. And the idea that she's on a throne, she's higher than these other men, that these Romans have to kneel down to her, this idea of divine kingship. And divine kingship as it comes into tension and conflict with the Roman world, which eschews, we are to understand this divine kingship. Of course, I have expressed in my book, When Women Ruled the World, in the chapter on Cleopatra, that this is exactly the moment when divine kingship of a different sort is forming in the Roman mentality in the Roman world. Julius Caesar is drawn to Egypt for the ideology that it can, and the money that it can afford him. And Octavian will continue this. Mark Antony obviously is there in between, but Octavian will divinize himself in a sense, will um, enthrone himself, will create a royal divine succession of a sort by using the wealth of Egypt and control of Egypt. So it's, a, you know, it's an interesting thing to see these things coming into tension with one another, and then to see how the game creators 
put in the, you know, that chair of Tutankhamen to the left. If you know your Tutankhamen objects, then you know that's an actual object. And we have that placed um, in this scene to the left. Next slide. Um, so we, um, with the, these next two slides, I wanna talk about how Cleopatra is remembered as a failure. Cleopatra is a name, however, that is very much a part of our cultural memory. If I'm actually, because I had to drop off my son at one of his rock gigs and I found myself in traffic in LA as one does caught unawares, I am sitting outside of a Starbucks um, at Venice and Sentinella. And if I went out to the bus stop and there's a guy right there and I said, hey, have you ever heard of Hatshepsut? He would be like, who, Hatshepsut, what? And I would say Hatshepsut, she ruled for 22 years. Um, she left Egypt better than she found it. Egypt was, was uh, extraordinarily successful during her reign with her nephew uh, and stepson, the III. No idea who Hatshepsut is. She is not remembered because her success is fungible and can be transferred to someone else. Cleopatra, on the other hand, is remembered as not having left Egypt better than she found it. Egypt is a mere province after the end of her lifetime, however that came about. And so her perceptions of her are um, tainted and she is that perfect cultural memory to help us know and internalize that women rulers are problematic. And this is, this is a nice um, patriarchally manufactured and continued cultural memory. Um, next slide, please. And that cultural memory found, finds itself in plays written by um, Shakespeare and others. It finds itself in multiple novels. Next slide. It finds itself in Hollywood movies. Some of the earliest movies um, that we have from Hollywood, Los Angeles, where I sit right now, are were about um, Cleopatra. Next slide. And we see that continued um, with... Uh, Elizabeth Taylor playing Cleopatra and we and, and notice the garments, no, notice um, the breasts, notice the makeup, all of these things. And Gal Gadot will soon be playing Cleopatra in a future feature film, which I think is um, in the can and they're editing and, and working on these things. So it'll be more discussion of our cultural memory of Cleopatra. Um, I'm sure it'll be a late stage capitalist redux of, um, of, um, white female feminist tropes that don't work for most people. And we can discuss when that comes out, but for now we'll go ahead and keep it with Elizabeth Taylor. Next slide. Uh, so here we have Assassin's Creed and Cleopatra placed in all kinds of different settings, palaces that are um, not preserved to us. And they are um, the, the, the game makers at, at Ubisoft are here creating these different um, locations for Cleopatra to exist within and many different garments, many different head coverings, different crowns, different hairstyles. And she is generally the female in the midst of a sea of men. Next slide. So the Orientalism I think is clear when you're playing the game. She is overtly sexualizing and she is overtly positioned as the seducer of good Roman men. She is the one that can take the good Roman man, turn him bad, and there are countless Roman texts um, written about this in Greek and in Latin. Um, I will note that the Ubisoft creators did try to read what the Romans had written about her. The Egyptians never comment on her appearance. They show her at Dendera Temple, but they're not there showing whether she's, or saying whether she's beautiful or ugly or any of these things. Um, but the Romans did discuss these things. And they say that while she wasn't classically beautiful, she was charming um, and her coinage shows her in that same way that she's not necessarily attractive. And the Ubisoft creators are walking that line. You can see that they're, they're not making her perfectly attractive though her body is, her face is not necessarily. And they're also walking this fine line of what her, her um, genetic expression, phenotype, um, a race, if we want to use that loaded term, but where she fits. Is she Egyptian? Is she Macedonian Greek? How are we to understand this Cleopatra? They give her a darker skin tone, and there are many classicists who would argue that Cleopatra had an Egyptian mother, 
and was either half or a quarter Egyptian. It's interesting that Ubisoft decided to give her this darker skin tone, though she is a Macedonian Greek. Um, how are we to understand that? Is that is that to be understood as a way of glorifying Egypt and giving Egypt a kind of giving Cleopatra to an indigenous Egypt in a sense, or is it a way of further orientalizing her? I haven't talked with the Ubisoft creators to understand what their choices about the darker skin actually mean, but it is a way of differentiating her from the Romans um, she is surrounded with. Next slide. So this, this woman, she depicted herself on Dendra temple in Egyptian ways and then using other hybrid statuary imagery relief for own coins. She represents herself as a goddess in control of great wealth, as a divine ruler. And I do set her up in my book, When Women Ruled the World, as a, as a ruler who um, is, is acting as a king. She is often called Lord of the Two Lands. There are titles that are rather masculinizing. And yet Cleopatra excelled in this Mediterranean arena of power and competition that she found herself in, in overtly um, sexualizing herself and connecting her body, literally and physically, to Roman warlords such that she could bear them children. And in many ways, out of all of the women that I examined in my book, When Women Ruled the World, she is the one that is acting the most like a man. Um, she is the one that is, in a, in a way, using Roman men, Roman warlords in particular, great Roman senators and patricians, as sperm donors. She's not marrying them. They're not marrying her. She's not giving them status. She's not putting them on the throne next to her, except in an informal way, Mark Antony perhaps. But she has four children with these two Roman men. And she starts, as her reign continues, she sets these children up in control of Egypt for Ptolemy the 15th, in control of Cyrenaica, in control of the Lebanon, in control of Cyprus, in control of Parthia and other places, Armenia. Um, dresses them in the indigenous garb of these places. And unlike the Ptolemies before her, who are all murdering and poisoning each other, she's actually creating good family relations with her children and trying to set them up to be extensions of her, very much as a man would do, um, to try to create more power in her Egyptian and larger Mediterranean world. Next slide. Um, no, wait, if you could go back one more, I'm so sorry, go back to that. Yeah, just stop here. So I'm not trying to say that the Ubisoft creators are sexualizing beyond what the ancient Egyptians did, because as you can see this image on the right, if this is Cleopatra or another Ptolemaic uh, queen, they are overtly sexualizing, showing that body almost as if it's naked, though it is covered with a garment, is something that we are to expect in the Egyptian understanding of where power and strength lies for a female in her ever-present youth and beauty. But let, let's discuss how these things are worked with through our Western eyes and Western lens. Next slide. Okay, so now let's talk about how she's over-sexualized in particular. Next slide. So here we see Cleopatra uh, from the Temple of Dendra here on the left. And then an image of her as a, as a kind of mother goddess on the right, a goddess with a breast that is full and ready to breastfeed in both cases, with a belly on the left that is fecund and ready to bear children um, there on the left. She's holding a sign of life in both scenes. She's holding a system of protection in the scene on the left. Next slide. And this idea of sex being connected to power is a very Egyptian thing. And here I'm going much further back in time and showing you an image of Nefertari, who is the great royal wife of Ramses II from her tomb in the Valley of the Queens. And here she's being led by the hand uh, by, um, uh, it looks like, yeah, Horus, son of Isis, is what he's labeled here in this text. And Nefertari is here labeled as the great royal wife, mistress of the two lands, Nefertari, may she be true of voice and may she live. And she is sexualized. She is made ever youthful. Her skin has a rosy hue to it. She is covered with jewelry and golden things. Um, her waist is very narrow. There are other scenes in this tomb that I don't think I've pulled from here that actually show Nefertari 
playing the game of Senna. And I, I encourage you to Google this and find this image. And her garment is open. And you can see her naked skin all the way down the front. And Senet, I would argue, is a way for the ancient Egyptians to talk about sexual intercourse through a euphemism, a euphemism of playing a game, a euphemism of passing through. And you see Nefertari being sexualized alone without any other males present beyond the gods. No king is present in this tomb of hers, which is, which is very interesting. Um, next slide. So this, um, this sexualized, um, ever beautiful, fully fleshed, fecund mother sex goddess like Hathor incarnate is very much what we're being presented with in the Ubisoft game. Next slide. So I, I'm interested in that the game made the choice to present her more as the young woman before the children are born, right? With um, Julius Caesar coming into Egypt, she hasn't uh, conceived the, the Ptolemy the 15th yet. She is here ready to conceive. She is very young. She is the most beautiful she will ever be. There is a choice to place her here, not at the moment of the greatest wars and the greatest contests, but at the height of her beauty and the height of her um, um, fecundity and um, value in a patriarchal society. Because as we all know, as women age in patriarchal societies, we age out of our value within these societies and two men. Um, and I, I was just listening to a podcast about dating apps and age and how women have to treat these dating apps in different ways compared to men at a certain age. And I, I think many of us um, in the audience know these things. Next slide. So the idea of the young woman, why did Ubisoft make this choice? And I find it very interesting that we surround ourselves when we're talking about people, um, men, in places of great power and great prestige, they surround themselves with these, um, these young females. And, you know, I have a selection here, obviously. Um, George Clooney is no longer with this young woman. He's with a different young woman, not quite as young as that blonde there. But, um, but still, this is a means of gaining power, um, having many children like Alec Baldwin. I think he's got his seventh child now. Um, it's a means of showing his own um, prowess as a man, ability to create children. It's a way of the woman to show um, her power with that man. There, there's all kinds of discussions one could have about why people in New York have so many children right now. It's interesting. And of course, Donald Trump with um, Melania, who is older now, but will have to fight the ever-present battle of staying young as long as she possibly can. So the gray-haired man with the younger woman, these are things that we expect. Um, next slide. And we see exactly this in the Ubisoft game. We have an older Julius Caesar with gray hair, with the wrinkles, with all of the expressions of age. He is the wise one. He is the one leading the army. She is the ingenue. She is the, the sex hungry woman. She's the one that's manipulating using sex. He is too, but he's got her on his arm to give him a cachet that he would not otherwise have, to give him a power within his patriarchy that he would not otherwise have. Of course, we could discuss how this will eventually end up causing his death. And I do discuss this in my book, When Women Rule the World. In this Ubisoft game, what causes his death, Julius Caesar's death, is his seduction by this woman who has ulterior motives, is her witchcraft, in a sense, her um, scheming, her, her bad morality, um, this, this lack of being a straight shooter, all of these things, this is what is going to cause Julius Caesar's demise. So he finds his demise very much at the hands of this young woman. This is his undoing, um, according to this perspective. Next slide. So we've, we've already discussed some of this, but it would be nice to look at some of the portraits we have preserved of Cleopatra from coinage, from statuary. You can see in the statuary on the right that these are all attributed to Cleopatra. They're not necessarily naming her. You wouldn't have a text on a bust like this. So these pieces attributed to her, do we present her as a beauty? Did the, did the ancient Romans, Greeks, Egyptians, Mediterraneans, however we understand these kinds of hybrid images, how do we understand her? Is she a beauty? Um, the image on the bottom right, I think is helpful. Um, we're told she had a, a larger nose, that she had strong features in her face but that she had very bright eyes, was a charming person. 
But then look at some of the coinage on the left, particularly the, 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 not the top right, but the other three. And you see this nose really um, given a um, pride of place on her face. And you can wonder what this actually means. Did she see these? And, and was she very upset? Did she demand that she be presented with a nose that represented her actual face? Um, but we're not talking about her as a beauty. We're talking about her as a character, if you like. She's creating a brand, I would argue, with her coinage by representing herself with something that is recognizable for, for people to, to see and to connect with her, whether it was necessarily attractive or not. It, given the assumption that rulers helped to mint their own coins, the, the images that she may have had the most control over ironically, are those very unattractive images to the left. There's more that classicists have said about this, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Next slide. Now, this idea of Cleopatra as the witch is something you will find in both Egyptian and Roman takes of Cleopatra. But let me explain what I mean. For the ancient Egyptians, being a witch is not a problem. Isis was the great one of magic. Isis is the one who was able to recreate a penis for her dead husband Osiris whom she creates pulls together from 22 and another 20 pieces and pulls together to create this this new body and the penis having been lost she makes one from her own magic if you look at the contendings of Horus Seth you see Isis um cutting off the hand of her son Horus and then immediately regrowing a new one so this idea of a witch in the Egyptian sense is not problematic it is instead one who is of great power and magic, but um, for the Romans, this is sorcery. It's witchcraft that is immoral. It is witchcraft that is taking a good Roman man with good morality and turning him against that morality in a, in a very interesting way. Next slide. So I've got some screenshots here that show her connection to this ability to put curses on people to use Egyptian magic in a way that is very harmful. And when she says something like curses will trouble you no more, it just means that she's killed them and they're done. It's over. But she has access as this divine female of a, of a country with a profound continuity of magical power. She then feeds into that power and is able to use it within this game. Next slide. Um, I'm not sure what I was, what I was putting here, but I, I do like this image of when she's shown in a contemplative moment, when she's shown smiling, um, the scene is, is as if, in my opinion, it's as if she's pleased with herself, as if she's, um, she's, she's scheming, she's plotting something, she's satisfied with something that's, that's gone right. And if you're playing the game, you often see that smile happen in those moments. Next slide. And we see her as a despot, the cruel mistress, the, the one who, unlike a Westerner perhaps, or a Roman or even a Greek person in this game, is somebody who is quite willing and able to dole out cruelty for fun, for entertainment, because she can, rather than for, for any other reason. Next slide. So here we have another screenshot. Of course, your face goes to the, the hair and the face and immediately to the breasts because those are exposed. Again, I'm not saying the ancient Egyptians wouldn't have done this, um, but it's, it's interesting the way the, the costume designers of this game created outfits that, that drew the eye in certain ways. So she says here in the, the screenshot, we need decisive action. It's time for assassinations. This is not necessarily... Um, uh, cruelty for its own entertainment, but the way it's said is it's time for assassinations. It's like she's done this before. We all know that Cleopatra fought a war against uh, Ptolemy the Thirteenth and had Ptolemy the Fourteenth assassinated. These are things that we do know from our history books. <coughs> and having grown up a Ptolemy, this is something that the Ptolemies did for breakfast, as I say. And if you're um, not sure about this, just read a little bit of Ptolemaic history and your, your jaw will fall to the floor. It's like Game of Thrones, but much worse. Next slide. 
So here we have um, have them boiled to death inside a bronze bull. I I think that there's um, connections to other mythology when we read about these things, but you see Cleopatra enjoying a, a death that is slow, that is horrible, that is visible, that is public, even though there isn't a whole lot of evidence that Cleopatra actually ordered these kinds of deaths in public. And it's certainly not an Egyptian thing. Um, though Egyptians did engage in impalement, you do have that. It could be argued that it was not used with as much um, uh, repeated action as crucifixion of the Romans. That's a discussion. That's a very arguable point I've made. We can discuss. Next slide. So uh, again, another image of our perception of Cleopatra. And here we have her in a painting done by Alexandre Cabanel, where she is getting ready to assassinate herself, to kill herself, and wants to determine what the best poison for her would be that would cause her the least suffering. And here we have Roman tales being told about her trying these poisons out on different prisoners. And here we have an image of her with a much more Macedonian, white, European-facing image, not the dark skin that we see in the Ubisoft game in this much earlier image about 100 years before. And yet you see her very calmly, serenely looking on, on the horrific deaths of these different men, completely unaffected. And she has even trained her ladies-in-waiting to do the same. And she has leoparded her feet and all of these things. I would argue that it's images like this that, that we're really pulling from to create this Cleopatra, that this Cleopatra is written primarily with the Roman and Greek sources, not with Egyptian sources in mind, except to clothe her, except to give her a setting. But in terms of personality, the only place her personality is discussed is in the Roman sources, which is why in my chapter in When Women Rule the World, I say we must throw out the Roman sources almost completely, because especially where they, with regards to her personality, because they are so biased, because they are trying to politically resuscitate uh, a Mark Antony, politically resuscitate and recreate as a king, in a sense, an Octavian. Um, next slide. She is the man killer. This trope comes up again and again in the game. And let me give you a, a few screenshots. Next slide. So she is sexually voracious and insatiable. She cannot be satisfied. She is willing to have sex with anyone and wherever. Um, it, this is a sexual hunger that the Romans would represent as highly dangerous, highly destabilizing, um, highly problematic, and which the Ubisoft male programmers are, are doing the same with. Next slide. Um, and here we have the continuation of this. I will sleep with anyone as long as they agree to be executed in the morning. So the young, eager man who's like, yep, I'll sleep with that hot young thing, um, will then realize that he's setting himself up for the loss of his own life. Is it worth it? Um, these are the things that people are asking. This is the theme of the game, one could argue. This is the theme because Julius Caesar will lose his own life. Mark Antony will lose his own life. Octavian makes the choice, no, I will not sleep with this witch, this whore, this insatiable sexual appetite. I won't put myself into that power and I will then be clean and, and keep myself away from this, this fray. Next slide. So here we have um, that ring is worth millions of drachmas. Cleopatra would lay um, with you if you gave it to her. So we have Cleopatra set up as a prostitute just directly. She would... Um, she would do anything for the money. She would do anything for the fame. She's willing to do anything for her own glory. Her reputation and uh, self is there. She's like um, the Melania before she married Trump, willing to show her naked body to anyone for the money. This is the image of Cleopatra that we're creating. Next slide. And I would compare this, and I would, <laughs> I would say that this is not Ubisoft that's pulling from Samiramis. Um, uh, the ancient Assyrian queen as represented in Greek uh, mythologized texts, I would say that the, these are the Romans that are pulling from Semiramis. The tale of a woman 
who was an Assyrian queen, um, I think of the ninth century BCE, who does nothing more than act as a queen regent on behalf of her young son so that her dynasty could continue. But in the Greek tales about her, we have her um, committing uh, adultery and lies and dressing as a, as a boy on the battlefield, killing the king on the battlefield, and then setting herself up as the, the king to be and being crowned on the battlefield, despite the fact that she is a woman. And then these tales of Semiramis where she sleeps with anyone, but she kills them in the morning. Where do these go back to? But of course, Ishtar of the Mesopotamian mythology of this, this sexually hungry uh, female goddess who, who is able to just use and abuse and eat men up for her sexual appetite. All of these things are, are woven together into this story of Cleopatra, woven together by the Romans in their propaganda against her, using very, very old tropes that, that have a lot of resonance in Mediterranean society and West Asian society. Next slide. She's also depicted as emotionally unstable because of course she has to be. Um, to remember her in our cultural memory as a woman who does not leave Egypt better than she finds it, we have to place her as somebody who is so power hungry and so drama um, beholden that she submits her, her own future to, to a bitter and bad end because she can't get away from her own hysterical emotional dealings. She is somebody who is unpredictable, who is uncontrollable, insatiable, and those things will be her undoing. And this idea, this idea of the female as the hysterical one who must be controlled by the men around her, the young one, the ingenue, the one who doesn't understand the stakes of the game, whereas all of these older men do, this is, this is something that's represented very clearly in this game. Next slide. Um, she is depicted as a druggie, as somebody who's willing to opt out of life. And I think this says a lot. Let me just give an example. I mean, I'm here on the corner of Venice and Sentinella in Los Angeles, and there's a homeless person right outside of my window. And as Los Angeles becomes more and more the home of the homeless, we blame addiction and people opting out of late capitalist society on the people who can't emotionally handle it. We blame their drug addiction on them. We blame their poverty upon them. We blame it on their lack of willingness to work. We, we do all of these things in our late capitalist society. We do so with moral impunity. And the Romans did the same exact thing. Um, and the Ubisoft programmers did the same exact thing. So this idea of Cleopatra being beholden to her interest in opting out of the moral and responsible thing to do, of going to sleep, of uh, checking out, this will set up her eventual suicide in which she abandons her Egyptian people, she abandons her sons, she abandons her daughters, she abandons everyone to the long sleep of death that she brings on herself in the way that she wants to bring it on. So we are setting up this woman who will take the easy way out. She's just going to commit suicide eventually. She's going to be that trope of the mother who, who just commits suicide and abandons everyone around her. But for Cleopatra, it's going to be much worse. The Romans set up Cleopatra, in my opinion, with their propaganda of the suicide as somebody who is, by her abandoning her children, in some ways murdering them before she murders herself. And so this idea of her being irresponsible and a drug addict fits with this, with this perfectly. Next slide. So it brings us to one of the questions I always have about Cleopatra, whether or not she committed suicide or whether or not she was murdered. And the only reason, I will repeat, the only reason that historians uncritically write that Cleopatra committed suicide is because the Romans tell us that Cleopatra committed suicide. But the Romans tell us a whole lot of things about Cleopatra that are less than uh, historically checkable, worthy, that could easily be given uh, a critical look with the understanding that this propaganda will serve Octavian and serve him well. 
Octavian is in a very difficult position in which he's fighting against a very popular senator, a very popular warlord, um, Marcus Antonius. And when he defeats him, he can use Cleopatra to resuscitate the character of Mark Antony and to cleanse and make himself innocent, to cleanse his battle against Mark Antony by making it a battle against Cleopatra. Now, now that he's beaten Cleopatra, he he could display her in a triumph in Rome. He could bring her there in golden chains. This is what we're told he wants to do. But that he knows will backfire because bringing a woman into a man's patriarchal arena of excess and cruelty in that display of the triumph might actually turn against him. It might actually martyr this woman, this, this Cleopatra. What better way, in my opinion, to take her out of the picture ideologically entirely than to give her a hero's death. We know that, well, the Romans tell us that Mark Antony murdered himself, that he, he killed himself by a hero's death with, the, with a sword blade. And this is what we're told. There's less reason to doubt this propaganda because this is something that we might expect from um, a, a Roman warlord, Roman senator, um, finding a more noble way out of this predicament that he's in. It's something that's less expected for a woman, for a mother, for a, a queen of Egypt. But if you do this to her in your texts, even if you murder on the side, Octavian can easily have her murdered. And then he can set it up and say, that she's committed suicide. By doing this, he masculinizes her, in my opinion. And in this patriarchal society, to give this woman a hero's death, to have her take herself out as Mark Antony killed himself, then you are having her opt out of the protection of her children. She is opting out of the protection of her family. And to have a woman do that versus a man, in our perception, it is seen as much more problematic and much more selfish for a female to do something like that. Next slide. And here we're at the end of the whole thing. And um, hopefully I'll be able to hear your questions when you, or, or be able to see your chats and all of these things. These are the places you can find me. This is my latest book, um, The Good Kings, Absolute Power in Ancient Egypt and the Modern World, which really hits authoritarianism um, dead on and our love affair with um, the Egyptian kings and our blockbuster exhibitions about these kings and how we have an insatiable consumption of these kings. And the book I wrote before that is the one I've been mentioning, When Women Ruled the World, um, where there is a chapter about, about Cleopatra. So you can find me in all these places. I have a podcast um, and I'm on all the socials. And um, yeah, we'll leave it there and, and you can stop the screen share and hopefully I can uh, see your, your chats and, and other things. Did that work? Great. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is this is not super intuitive on mobile, but you know, I really appreciate you guys putting this together. This has been a super cool um conference. Uh Dr. Cooney, thank you for taking the time to coming in and talking to us today. Um so yeah, I'm really curious um if you could talk about what the kind of process was for when Ubisoft approached uh, you and I think um, the the Near Eastern Languages Department at UCLA 
Uh, you said it was only about 20 hours that you guys had kinds of discussion, so I was just kind of curious as to, you know, what they were asking, um, what their concerns were, because uh, it seems they, they like they... weren't asking a whole lot, to be honest. It was a very um, transactional relationship, and they flew me to Montreal, where... Um, I mean, I'll just go ahead and be real in this small venue. Um, I was told to just show up for questions and have a discussion. And then when I showed up in Montreal, in the middle of a snowstorm, actually, I was told, oh, we're all waiting for your presentation. And I walked in, I said, I don't, I didn't prepare a presentation. I wasn't told to prepare a presentation. And, and then the room filled with about 50 male coders, programmers. Um, there might have been one woman out of the the 50, they all gathered in the room. And I was then put on the spot with my computer and I hooked up to Google and I started Google imaging, architecture, uh, flora and fauna, costumes, statuary, because I hadn't prepared anything for what it was that they actually wanted. So in a way, um, it, was, um, it was a complicated uh, conversation. I will say that it, it was um, even um, a little touch and go in terms of personalities and expectations and communication. And then when I left, there would be some back and forth. Um, can you put together a PDF with images of this or that, which I did do. And, um, and there, but there wasn't like, we need to really talk about race or we need to really talk about identity or we need to talk about age or we need to talk about feminist ideas. There was very little interest in this, and I think it's clear in the game that there's interest. That, that lack of interest is clear. I will also say that the educational version of the game that they put out, I found shockingly bad. Um, what they say about Hatshepsut as a female ruler is bad and wrong. What they say about mummification is bad and wrong. Like, you go to mummify somebody, and you put your hands into the person, and it makes this, like, gross gut sound, and it's like... It's you, you were in it and the cavity is like cut all the way down from stem to stern of the person. This is not how mummification worked for the ancient Egyptians. This is not the purpose. And it was there to be as um as shocking, I think, or gross or cool as it could be, but it wasn't there to give a story of educational value. And then as you're wandering around the different spaces, I found the flora and fauna wrong. Um, I found a lot of the uh, architecture to be problematic. And I'm not saying that if you go in the pyramid and you get a, an Easter egg or something and you find a certain place that's a secret mystical place, that that's bad and wrong. I'm fine with taking license and creating story and, and creating cool things out of what is really there. What frustrates me is how little movies, companies, producers, programmers are willing to work with the actual experts from the beginning not from when the game is already deep into the process, such that I have an adversarial relationship with programmers who are mad at me for telling them certain things that I think are problematic in the in their game. Um, these things need to be happening from the beginning. Um, and, and so that's that's my take on consulting as a whole. We're not that expensive. We're really not. And um, I've actually, in the meantime, this was some years ago, probably... 10 years ago now that that relationship with Ubisoft, very short relationship occurred. And I've since started my own company, um, a consulting company called Patina Productions that then works with clients like Apple, Disney, and others um, to create authenticity from the beginnings of a project, ideally, rather than when people are deep into it. Because once you're deep into a project, you can't change things. And even changing things for authenticity mess with your narrative, mess with your storyline, and it can be quite problematic. So I, I have a lot more I can say about consulting, but um, this wasn't one of my happiest moments with, with consulting. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I don't think you'll be surprised to know that the, um, the lead creative director for Assassin's Creed Origins, uh, Ashraf Ismail, was fired for... Our, um, allegations of sexual misconduct in the company. And this is something that's been pervasive in Ubisoft specifically. So I'm not surprised when you mentioned that you walk into a room and it's like 50 men and only one woman consulting or, yeah. you know, speaking yeah. with you. Yeah. Um, it, so it was, very it was disappointing. not a happy feeling in that place. It really wasn't. It really wasn't. All right. All right. Well, thank you again. Yeah, thank you. I didn't know that about the director of this game. So 
that it, it fits a lot of the things that I, that I dealt with in that very short encounter. And it fits, it's, it's interesting, this idea of that you have like a feeling about something, and you're like, this is not right. And then when I saw the game, and, I, and they came to UCLA, they set up the game. It was this big, big for us, for the NELP department. But um, it was this moment that was in the press, we invited the press, and I hated the game. I didn't want to hate the game, but I hated the game. And, and they showed up, and I'm like, this is, I, I had the earphones on, I'm like grandma with my headphones. And I started yelling, and I realized I was yelling, it's, you know, stupid people who don't do tech. And I started going, oh my god, this is horrible. This is wrong. Puck Trips, it would never. It was not, it didn't work out the way it, that it was meant to. So I'm not a fan of this game. And it's really upsetting because these things are super formative. Males and females play these things, and to see this just feed into all of the gaming tropes of misogyny and um, harassment and, and outright aggressive behavior towards females in the gaming world, it all fits perfectly. And here she is, you know, forever encapsulated in this game as a, a you know, a, a duplicitous whore. Here we are. Well, thank you for that enlightening and engaging response there. Great questions. Surprising answers all around. Uh, I want to call out just two other questions that came to us from the chat, one from Aristotle and then one from Adam. Uh, from Aristotle, uh, he asks, how much of your input did they use in the rendition of architecture and material culture? You know, I don't really think they used too much of it, but also the, when I showed up, the game was already deep in process and they showed me things that they had already created. And so I think there was that, you know, you can tell us what you think, but we know better and really just stop. Um, like there was a preponderance of camels in the game. And I'm like, look, yeah, there are camels in Roman Egypt. It's, it is a thing. They're there, but they're not going to be like everywhere in your scene like they are in modern Egypt. Um, so, you know, um, UCLA has a bit of a, a lock on weird things like we, we had um, Amr Shahat, who was with us at the time, and he's a, a floral expert. He's an archaeobotanical expert. The plants are all wrong. The plants are all European. Is that something to destroy a game over and excoriate programmers for? Not necessarily. But if you're going to put oak trees all over the place, you could at least try to get the, the setting of the Egyptian landscape correct to at least try to understand what a big oasis in the northeastern part of Africa would look like and to not just have it be European, to not just have your Game of Thrones idea that people are going to fight from horseback with a sword at their side like a medieval knight. There's going to be a lot more donkey riding and a lot more unsexy things, but um, I, I don't think a lot of what I said was was used. So, yeah. It was the same, you know, I consulted for this um, TV show uh about Tutankhamun. I don't remember what it was called, but Ben Kingsley was in it. You can look it up. And by the time I was able to start the consulting, the script had already been locked down and it had already been cast. And anything that I said could only be taken so far because so many, many of my criticisms were so deep that um, there, was no, there was no way to fix it without changing the story and characters and other things. And this they were not willing to do. So th there's only so much you can do with a consultancy if the project is well along in that consultancy. For that, uh, going over to the other question we had from Adam, uh, since you used an early painting, uh, sorry, early modern painting when talking about uh, ceramics and your very well observed trope of the lustful queen, I'm curious about a potential inversion in the uh, apocryphal story of Judith and Holofernes. I'm sorry I'm butchering these names. She acts like how uh, Semiramis is accused of, but does so as a ruse to protect her people and is praised for it. This story was known in Roman times and got more popular through the <coughs> Middle Ages and Renaissance. And so I'm curious, do you see Judith in dialogue with Cleopatra in all the sources about her? I think that's for others to work on and not me at this point. I think that Cleopatra's story is in dialogue with a whole lot of other um, mythological, um, biblical uh, stories, narratives, tropes in West Asian uh, deep cultural memory in the Mediterranean. 
And I will also say that not all of these tropes are necessarily negative because if you read Apuleius's Golden Ass, for example, um, and you read about this metamorphosis, this transformation that the character goes through willingly and unwillingly, physically and, and um, cerebrally and emotionally, Isis or the goddess or a Cleopatra sexualized uh, queen of her people who is using her sexuality for good, for protection, um, uh, to stand in front of, Is of Osiris and protect him. There is a very positive understanding of Cleopatra from the perspective of the Isis cult, I would argue. And the Isis cult spreads like wildfire after the death. Of Cleopatra. And I do even want to make a comparison to a Jesus cult. Is that too much? It's up to you guys to, to argue. Um, but this, this idea of Cleopatra being a mistress, uh, being a witch, but, but understood in a positive way, this is something that lasts until you get to, um, oh crap, what's her name? Zenobia. Zenobia, I think of the fourth century, right? Fighting against Rome, like Boudicca of, uh, for the Britons. She's there masculinizing. Uh, Zenobia makes direct claims to Cleopatra. And Cleopatra in West Asian remember, memory, cultural memory, is positive. And there her sexuality can be used in a positive way. Her witchcraft can be used in a positive way. But so much of what we in the West refuse to read are these Arabic sources, these West Asian sources that put Cleopatra in a more positivist light, um, or the sources from, from Zenobia's time, Aramaic sources, I presume. Um, we don't use those. Instead, we use the Latin and Greek sources from the Western world that, uh, that demonize her. And that is our preferred way of dealing with Cleopatra. And um, we need more correctives here. So I, I think Ju Judith and Holofernes, sure, go for it. Write it up. Sounds like a good article to me. Okay, uh, quick question here. I'm curious, so I know you said when, when you were approached by Ubisoft, the, the game itself was pretty much locked and there wasn't a lot you could do, which is <laughs> like understandable considering these, these things take time and if they don't start with a historian right there, then it's like game over. But I'm curious, were you approached at all about working on something like the Discovery Tour? Because I know they, they literally market this as a completely separate mode, it's supposed to be the actual educational one where they teach you stuff. And now I know one of the people who wrote some of the blurbs for the tour. Uh, now she didn't really get a lot because she came in toward the end. But I'm like, if that mode seems like even the info in there is wrong, it's wrong. Know, it's then it's like, what's what the hell is the point wrong. of doing that? And they and, told me that they did have an Egyptologist on staff, mm -hmm. and. If they had an Egyptologist on staff, how much should they listen to that person? Because it doesn't seem like a whole hell of a lot. Um, if mummification is wrong, then it's just wrong. Because you and I can Google that in two seconds and learn that there's a small incision on the left side, that they take out these organs. There's not like a big rip from stem to stern of the person that you put two hands into and just goop around inside of the intestines. What the hell is the point? Except to have a shocking image that you can show to, to you know, to to students. Um, I found it very problematic and their depiction of female rule is problematic. This is not to say that when I pick up a sixth grade textbook and how they represent the ancient Egyptian world is not problematic in my view, but I've often been invited in Los Angeles County to do workshops with educators and I'll sit down with sixth grade teachers and I'll be like, this is how I like to present Egypt. This is how the kids really connect with it. And I get all these questions and the teacher's are like, oh my God, I'm going to put this in my lesson plan. And a lot of the things that I've communicated, at least in LA County, LAUSD, has been written up by people and, and is communicated by people making those lesson plans. So there is interest. Um, for them to say this was educational, I think is bullshit. And it's a way of creating a pious virtue signaling that they really have no business to get, in my opinion. I'm wondering if it is kind of an offshoot of when you say, you know, you want to hoist, you know, failure or just blame on women, because I know the Egyptologist they had on staff was a woman uh, and they didn't. So I'm questioning now if yeah. they didn't use her. Yeah, she was a woman. Yeah. 
if they yeah, didn't I use valid stuff, why on earth would they then choose to put her, like I know for the Great Pyramid stuff, they chose to talk about Houdin's theory, which I know is not very popular in Egyptology. So I'm like, why would they use that of all the things she provided and not like the accurate stuff? <coughs> I mean, Houdin's theory, in my opinion, is as accurate as anything else. We don't have evidence for uh, ramps going around the pyramids or going extending in one ramp that would go for a kilometer or more. We don't. So the fact that we don't know how the pyramids were built, I think, is as cool as anything else. Um, it's the littler things, you know. You're, you're going to put pyramids in there. Okay, fine. Um, the rooms are right. The architecture is right. But there was lost opportunities for so much of the human elements that we judge quite harshly that I found horribly problematic in terms of female rule in particular, um, misogynistic to be, to be quite open about it. So how much they're actually listening to her, they're probably saying, you know, oh, but we need a good story and this isn't going to make a good story. We need it. We need an enemy. We need this or that. They clearly are setting up the Romans as the good guys and Cleopatra as the bad guy. And so they have their, they have it written in that Hollywood way. Um, nuance is not something that video game narratives have befriended. Uh, again, I'm not a gamer, but it seems to me that simplistic tropes uh, work well. Unfortunately, for a game like this that you can immerse yourself in, for hour upon hour upon hour, you could use so much more nuance and so much more personality driven, um, difficult politics, uh, hard choices, but instead things are streamlined and simplified, made very black and white. And um, yeah, I, I, I find it problematic. So I don't know how much say she had, we, we would have to ask her. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, final question for you. It's, it should be pretty short, pretty simple. But I mean, okay, we have the main game, which is about 35 hours to play through. And then they market the discovery tours an extra 10 to 15 hours of educational material. Um, but if it's got so many things that are wrong within even that mode, is this something you think that like, should we be using this to teach people and then just pointing out what they got wrong? Or is it like so wrong that like, maybe we shouldn't use this to teach people because what they're seeing is just not even close. So I, there was an RC conference about this, a uh, panel about this, uh, probably before the pandemic, maybe 2019, maybe 2018, I don't remember. Um, Christian Casey was a part of it, I remember. Nadine Muller was in the audience. Nadine Muller is a gamer, unlike me. And she loves this game. Christian Casey loves this game. I am in the minority of Egyptologists who do not like this game. Um, I will say that straight up. And I would say lots of Egyptologists would rather be in the spotlight. And this is no knock against the two people I just mentioned. That's, that's not what I mean. I'm just saying that most Egyptologists I know are happy to have Egypt in the spotlight, even if it's shitty, rather than um, have it not be in the spotlight and be authentic. And so if that's the trade that some people feel they have to make in this late capitalist world, then I think many Egyptologists are willing to make it and willing to use the game. Um, I found it so problematic. I'm not willing to use it, but I think most people I know are. So yeah, that's, um, that's my perspective. And uh, most of the graduate students at UCLA right now, if, I don't see as much gaming now. Um, there was more interest in using this in the classroom. I think Carrie Arbuckle McLeod uses it in the classroom. It's a way of bringing people in. Here's the problem. Carrie Arbuckle McLeod can correct the shit out of this thing. She knows everything up and down. She can do that, um, teaching in Saskatchewan. But other people aren't going to know how to do that. And so using this in the classroom, in my opinion, without that voice of authenticity and deep knowledge there, is going to create more problems than it's going to solve. Oh, boy. Got our work cut out for us then. Yeah, we do. We always do, though. We always yeah. do. That's true. That's true. The work yeah. never stops. I, I, I don't mind if they produce a, a, a video game. It's fine. Do not produce an educational discovery mode that's full of mistakes and call it that. Then I'm going to lose my shit. I think that's valid because, yeah, yeah. The, it's all about the branding. It really is. You know, branded game is entertainment. Uh, yeah. Discovery mode, not so much. Any more questions out here before we let Kara run to do her things, her awesome things? 
we just got some uh, general comments from folks in the chat, so thank you for those. And I think, yeah, some good points. Uh, you can balance uh, exciting and accurate, just a matter of how you do it and if you're willing to do it. Um, yeah. And I, I think a good note that some people have mentioned here too is that a lot of the tendencies in the AAA kind of big budget game industry, there are a lot of nuanced stories that happen in the indie games, but with that nature, a lot of people don't even know they exist. So <laughs> it's that balance um, or lack thereof. <coughs> um, so. What that means is that we who in control of the, the authentic story need to get involved in producing video games. We need to do this. So. Certainly. Hit me up. Yeah. Okay, Carol, <laughs> we're waiting for you. Wrong. You have your own company. Come on, where's the I game? I where's the game? And, I'm our, and I have talked to people about this. So this isn't something that, again, I'm not a gamer, but hell, I'd create one. Um, that, that's fine. So if, if that's something that people are interested in doing, they have connections to do. I mean, I'm in a place where I can do this with people in person. Um, the, everything's here. So this kind of thing could happen. It's just a, a question of me connecting with the right people in the right way. Um, I could build a team in, in no time, a brilliant team, and and we could do it right from the beginning. Okay, so. someone fund this. Someone get on this side. <laughs> I want something that's accurate. It's good. Well, we can only hope and seize those opportunities as they come. I, I will say for my very small part in writing an indie game, we have reached out to people as subject matter experts to get their opinions, to get things right, particularly when it pertains to a cultural relevancy. I did my own independent research for a character who is an elevator inspector. I've got some things wrong, I'm sure, certain of. We can accept those inaccuracies, but when it really comes down to people's personhood, that is something that I am of the persuasion that we can do better. Uh, and hopefully we can all get there together. So Kara, thank you again for a really riveting presentation. No punches pulled as usual, which we love to hear. Um, <laughs> and thank you all to everyone else who has joined us here for this first day of our inaugural Hit Points in History conference. Uh, this has been the final presentation for today's programming, but we are not closing the space yet. We'll still be open for a little while here for the next hour or so. For, well, just like any other good conference, you to mingle, meet with each other, chat in the virtual hallways, play some games in the arcade, or get lost in the maze. Uh, or Adam, intentional or not, you might be dancing there. And I think after a uh, very engaging day like today, uh, dancing is certainly in order. If you do want to dance, you can press the Z key, F to shoot some confetti. Um, but yeah, please check out the Exhibitor Hall. Um, we will be making recordings of today's presentations available on YouTube in the uh, days and weeks to come. So thank you all for coming here. Please mingle and interact with each other and enjoy the rest of our Hit Points History Conference tomorrow when presentations resume.